Him I will bring. You are the Lord of Lords. You are the mighty God. You are the King of all kings. So now I give back to you the song that you gave to me. You are the song that I sing. And I keep falling in love with you over and over. as we sing together. <clears throat> Sit is the song I'm singing today. I'm ready. time. Charlie, don't, don't change. Let's, let's go to the first verse. Let's, let's, let's sing like we're really redeemed. Eh? Can you try it one more time? Like we're really redeemed. <clears throat> Sweet is the song I'm singing today. I'm redeemed. I'm redeemed. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Hardes Mora. Lekker for you to see. Welcome, Thais. Um, I'd like to welcome Nicole and Morne. You are hi there. Remember you from yesterday. Good stuff. Welcome. Lovely seeing you. Welcome home. Um, I'd like to welcome Nico and Morne. They are with Yvette and Joran. Their daughter visits Ali quite a bit, and it's really wonderful seeing her too. So uh, I'd like to also welcome Jackie and Tim with us this morning. Good morning. Welcome. Nice having you here in the beautiful Western Cape. Uh, I believe one of your, your sons moved to Cape Town. Excellent. Please give him our love. 
uh, and best wishes for his relocation. I'd like to also just um, quickly hold up some announcements before you uh, this morning. In the same way, let your light shine in front of people so that they will see the good you do and praise the, God, the Father in heaven. I'd like to also ask for prayers for Eric Bressler, for Ursula Stubbs, and Dorothy Borsoff, likewise for Falkma. And then also please continue your prayers for Yvette, the Sloan family, and also her family. Uh, we had a memorial yesterday, and I'd like to also just thank those who participated and helped to make that event very special for the family that were here. Today is Jody Hartle's birthday, and we wish her well. We also want to wish Bernadette Bayer well for tomorrow. Uh, Charlotte Matty, her birthday is on the 8th of February. She, uh, and you might wonder where she is. They live out in the Strand, and more often than not, she does work over weekends. So it's very tough. She and Tico works for the same, well, in the same world, hematology, but they work in different hospitals. David Enslin's birthday is on the 10th of February, and I just want to announce to Wayne and Rachel that um, it is a special day, so maybe cake and tea is in order for him to make him feel special. David, are you okay with that? Good stuff. Vaughan for Safi's birthday is on the 10th of February, and uh, we pray. Oh, thank you. That's wonderful. That God will bless them in a very special way. Andre and Leonie Boertis' anniversary is on the 11th of February, and uh, that's a special day, Andre uh, and Leonie. Daarom nog <laughs> I, 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 I. Uh, uh. <laughs> well, um, as alles goed gaan, dan het ons nog een anniversary Satra. Daar zijn. <laughs> Tisha, good morning. How are you? My word, that is wonderful seeing you. Uh, and your better half. What is your name, Squire? Alan. Alan. It is just wonderful seeing you. Wonderful seeing you. Um, you don't mind if I say a little something. I've got to just tell you very quickly. During COVID, when COVID started, Tersha uh, donated to us the hand. Um, I'm going to hold it to you. These very, we still use them. She donated it to us because they were eco-friendly. Um, she holds a very strong view regarding um, the chemicals that is being used and she and her beautiful daughter, Bronwyn, they brought it to the house and said, please make this available to the church. So, she, you know, I just want to thank you, Tisha. We've been in contact this last week, and it's just wonderful having you with us this morning. Please feel welcome. And Alan, you're an extension of this. Welcome home. Good seeing you. Fantastic. Um, Tuesday, ladies' class at 10 a.m., Ali will be teaching at the church building and the Zoom platform will be available. So please, if you would, um, avail yourself of that. The ladies are in an incredible book. I think it's called Women in the Shadows. Have I got it right, Sue? And apparently this book is of such great value because what it does is it speaks of all the women in the Bible that is not really mentioned by name. Uh, we're talking about Job's wife and I think probably... See, uh, uh, the cat that sentenced Jesus, what's his name? Pontius Pilate, Pontius Pilatus, Pontius Pilate, <laughs> probably his wife would be in there somewhere. So please, um, these, these studies are amazing. I've not listened to them, but Sue and I spoke about the content over in America and then also here when the book was introduced. It's an amazing book for women. A Wednesday night Bible study will be at the building. We're working through the life of Moses and um, through his ups and downs, and they were incredible, especially if you're a young Christian. They will be of great value to you in terms of understanding what does happen when you come out of captivity, and also the call of leadership, which unfortunately very few people respond to because it is a tough place to be. But here's the, the thing. It deals with leadership, but it also deals with the formation of leadership, and that is what you will learn inside of that study. Leonard and Tracy, good morning. Welcome back from Mossel Bay. Uh, we've been praying for you and, and, and especially for mom. I'd also like to uh, mention the Durbanville group will be meeting at the home of Johan and Katharina Gerber 
Joe will be teaching the lesson. Bible study will be on Zoom. Please speak to Johan Gerber for the details. <coughs> Mama Spree and the Paul Group, uh, please contact Darren McLaughlin or Johan Pinar for Mama Spree and Paul details. Um, they also have a Zoom platform that they work in. Their Bible study starts at 6.30. And um, I've listened in on their studies and likewise on the others of Johan, and those are very, very good studies prepared by folk within the Bible study. Food parcels, and I want to just tell you the significance of this, especially when somebody had a crisis in their home. Um, I think especially of Joan and, Chris and, and Yvette, when their mom had passed away, that the church would have helped them and sent them something at least that they can then focus on uh, taking care of people visiting and not having to prepare uh, food for themselves. And sometimes when people fall sick and ill, we also assist. So please, if you would uh, like to donate via via an EFT, please mark it, frozen foods, and we will know which way it must be, or rather, not we, Richard and Jeff. Um, Sunday evening singing service, we'd like to restart our Sunday evening services. And uh, we're looking at the 12th of February at the first one, and it'll be at 5 o'clock for a singing service in the evening. It is the kind of thing that I think um, would place a platform, and this need came out in our ministry meeting, that sometimes we don't, um, our repertoire of songs are just very limited. But Sunday mornings is not a place to learn a new song. And so we're creating a space not only for learning new songs, but also for young men to be able to learn and to be able to teach in a, an environment that is loving and caring and undergirding of their development. Um, nothing happens by accident. Everything is intentional. And so often we think that the only time we come to worship is on a Sunday morning. But that's why we're creating this space so that somebody who, would, who can preach, but they feel, I would like to refine my craft, we create that space on a Sunday evening. There are also some other things that we are thinking about to have, uh, to arrive, have a devotional, just telling you some of the formats that was thrown and put on the table, is to come together and as a congregation on a Sunday evening, have a devotional, and then we split into specialized classes for men and women. And topics that are unique to them will be dealt with in that environment. I brought some excellent material back. Um, and uh, hopefully we can look at that and with the guys that are teaching, select the material that will be appropriate so that we can um, have a different dynamic, but an interesting dynamic which really makes Sunday evenings much more meaningful and gives much more sense to being together on a Sunday evening. All right, so next week, Sunday evening, the 12th of uh, February at 5 p.m., we will be meeting here. Obviously, we're feeling our way through it. Five o'clock, I think it's a good time with many of the mothers saying, uh, and we spoke to more people this week, and they said, please, um, five o'clock is good till six o'clock. I can get home. I can get my children uh, ready, get, make sure all their homework is done so that they are ready to go to bed early on a Sunday night. Communion cups, please, if you'd be so kind, help us and put it in the receptacle on your way out. We'll sterilize them for usage on the next time. Brendan, without further ado, um, I don't think there's anything else that we might have missed. Let's go to our Father in prayer. Ons almachtige God en ons Himmelse Vader, voor ogen kom ons voor u, Heere, as kinders wat voor die troon van genade hulle Vader aanspreek en sê, Heere, ons wil dankie sê vir wat u in ons leven kon doen hierdie week wat voorbij is. Heere, ons het baie ervarings gehad, partij van hulle Heere nog onaangenaam, maar daar was ook baie Heere wat ondersteunend was en heelend was. And so, Father, we think especially today of Yvette and Joran, their friends, their family, that have had to have a moment in their life yesterday where they could with dignity bid farewell to Serena. Father, she was loved by her family, and certainly, Father, the gap that she's left in their life is huge. And so, Father, we thank you for every single person that has contributed and helped to undergird this beautiful family during the difficult times. Father, we honor you with our life, and we thank you that you've blessed us 
with opportunities to serve others. Father, it's great to see Tertia as well as Alan. It's wonderful, Father, to have Tim and Jackie. It's great to have um, Hannes here this morning and many other folk, Father, we think especially our friends Nicole, um, Nicole and Mornay. Father, this morning we're going to be worshipping you. We're going to be reminded of the covenant that exists between us and the blood that your son has sacrificed on our behalf. Father, we come before you as a people that acknowledges, Lord, that this week we would have failed you. And so with our sin, we confess. And we thank you, Lord, that your blood of Christ washes us clean when we confess our sin. Father, please bless us today as we worship you together as a family. And as we together, Father, realign our thoughts today to live a life of righteousness in your presence. Father, we think of those in pain today. We think of Eric Bresler, a man who we love very dearly, Father, and know that he's struggling with his health. We also think of Ethne that is also struggling, and as well as Ursula Stubbs, Father, someone we love so dearly, as well as Dorothy Borsoff and Falkmer. Father, every single person in our family is important. And so, Father, this morning we bring them to you and ask that you'll bless, strengthen, and raise them up, Father, where they feel that they are weak. Father, in our midst of family that are hurting, maybe not for any of the reasons we have mentioned, but, Father, we pray that somehow today you will help us understand that we can move beyond our hurt and we can run into the arms of a caring Father who loves us and cares for us and will gladly help us in order to heal, to mend, and to grow. Above all else, Father, we seek that you are glorified in everything we do and say, so that your name will be held high and your kingdom advances steadily but intentionally in this world. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. Okay, let's sing together this one. Oh, fill my cup and lay it over. Fill my cup and lay it over. Fill my cup and lay it over. Fill my cup and lay it over.
little bit high. Then we won't be able to talk over the church. <coughs> <coughs> oh, that all I can cross, so to spice by the word, hence the one was attraction for me. For the children of God, let this go. Good morning. Uh, to prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper this morning, uh, if you've got your Bibles uh, with you and ready, and I hope you do, uh, I'd like to read a couple of verses from uh, the Gospel of Matthew, uh, chapter 26, uh, from verse 26. Matthew, chapter 26, from verse 26. Now, as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take eat, this is my, my body. And he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. Uh, for this is my blood of the, of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. And verse 29, Jesus said, I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. So in my world, uh, and I suppose in many of yours as well, we live by contracts. A contract is a, a commitment, a promise that is in writing, uh, to do or not to do something. Uh, on a daily basis, we, we sign LOIs and MOUs and RSAs or resellers agreements or loan agreements. Um, if we're in business and have partners, we, we sign shareholders agreements and, uh, and the list goes on and on. You know, uh, people businesses, governments, into, into all sorts of all kinds of agreements. And by verifying, doing that, they verify to agree with the terms and conditions. Uh, and by doing that, we put our initials or our signatures at the bottom of each page. And usually at the end of that contract, we put our full name or signature stating and promising to keep within that documents, uh, term, terms and conditions. Even if we fall in love, Derek, yeah. we, sign a, we sign a contract. Um, <laughs> Any one of us that's been in business for some time would, would know and will have the experience what happens if one of the parties breaks such an agreement or contract. We all know and we realize that there are, in many cases or most cases, there are severe consequences if we break a contract and therefore we all do our utmost best to keep within those terms and conditions of such contract that we've put our initials on or our full signature on. The consequences of breaking a contract could 
and are in most cases devastating. It is usually goes in hand in hand with great financial and also emotional loss. As Derek mentioned earlier on, uh, this Saturday it's our 34th uh, <laughs> wedding anniversary. And uh, so 34 years ago we, signed, we also signed a contract, you know, you and I. <laughs> but not only a contract, but we also signed the contract before God as witness. And we understand what the consequences will be if we break that contract. In the Bible, we also read about contracts or agreements. From the beginning of time, God closed deals with contracts with man, and every time man actually broke those contracts. The first contract I want to refer to, or the contract I want to refer to, God speaks through the prophet Jeremiah in a very well-known passage in the 31st chapter from verse 30. From verse 31, he says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant, a new contract with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not like the contract that I made with them, with their fathers, on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. He says, Because by that covenant or that contract <clears throat> that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant, or this is the contract that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, declares the Lord, I will put my law within them, and I will write in their hearts. I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each teach the neighbor, and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the from the least. Of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their inequities and I will remember their sins no more. This contract that God made with the house of Israel and by implication to us was, very, was also very important to the Apostle Paul or the writer of the book of Hebrews because the writer of the book of Hebrews also refers to that, the same contract in Hebrews chapter 8 from verse 8 from verse 8 following. Today, or the first day of the week, when we come together, we also celebrate and we remember this new covenant or this new contract that you and I signed before God the day that we accepted the gospel of Jesus Christ. We take of this bread and the fruit of the vine to remember the act of love of the sacrifice. We remember Jesus and the suffering and the feeling of betrayal and the feeling of loneliness. I think loneliness is something that's neglected in this world today. I think that loneliness is the modern cancer. We spend our time, times in crowds. We spend our times on small screens. And we seem happy. But the world is lonely. When we think about the crucifixion, we often think about the physical abuse, the pain, and the mocking, but we seldom think about the mental abuse or rejection and the loneliness that Jesus had to endure. When Jesus cried out, My God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? I think it was in my book, The Utmost Cry of Loneliness. You know, there's an African singer, and in one of his songs, he asked this question, who pluck a man's a place op a heart? If you feel lonely today, these emblems that we are about to partake of reminds us that Jesus has risen. We are not alone. He is alive. He looks out for you and for me. He watches over us till the trumpet sounds. Kom ons bid saam vir die brood. Ons almachtige God en Himmelse Vader is met dankbaarheid in ons harte, o Vader, dat ons die troon van genade en hierdie dag nader. Vader, ons dankie vir die groot liefde wat jy gehad het vir die mens, dat jy die Seen gestuur het na die aarde toe. Vader, ons dankie dat die Seen gehoorzaam was tot die dood toe, dat hy op die kruis van Golgotha gesterf het, so dat ons kan hoop jy op die eeuwige lewe. Ons dankie vir die eerste dag van die week, Vader, waar ons as een familie by mekaar kan kom. Ons dankie vir die geleendheid wat ons het om hierdie brood te breek. 
Ons dankie vir die contract wat u met die mens gesluit het, toe vader, en dat ons daarbij kan bly. Ons dankie vir die beloftes wat in die woord opgeteken is, so vader, ons weet dat het eeuwig en, en waar is. Ons dankie dat u die woord vir ons, die licht vir ons pad en die lamp vir ons voet is. Hemelse vader, ons dankie dat ons weet dat daar die woord levend en krachtig is. Bid dat u elkeen, saam, saam met elkeen van ons sal wees, wat van hierdie symbole sal deelneem, dat u ons elkeen in besonder sal sien in hierdie dag, en dit is ons gebed in Jesus' naam. Amen. Ja, dit is hy rade light en neve, brede. Welkom, moenie. Ja, just give them the opportunity to also partake of the bread before we say thanks for the food of the wine. Dear Lord, we thank you for this uh, opportunity to partake of the fruit of the vine. Thank you, uh, Lord, that we know that this fruit of the vine is a symbol of uh, your son's blood that flowed on Calvary. Dear God, we thank you for the covenant, the new covenant. Thank you for all the promises, the eternal promises in your word that we can live by that. Bless each and everyone that partakes of this in a worthy manner. And this is we pray, our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. So we now have the opportunity to give back to the, to the Lord as, as we've been prospered. And uh, let us give with a, with a cheerful heart and the church needs cash. Can you help us for it to come, Mr.
please bow your heads with me. Dear Lord in heaven, we thank you so much for another day where we can gather as your children. Lord, we thank you so much that we can be reminded of your son Jesus Christ's sacrifice. Lord, this morning we also reminded how you provide for our daily needs. And Lord, we have this opportunity to give back to you. We pray and ask that you bless the money, all the different outreaches that we are involved with as a congregation. And Lord, that we will continually honor you with our hearts, our minds, and the talents that you have given to us. We pray this through your son's name, and if it is to be your will, amen. Okay, for, this, for the next song, um, we'll rise all together, the other one, the one after this one. Okay, this is 448, four yes. Okay, so this song will definitely depend on the strength of everybody who can sing and those who can make heavenly, wonderful noises. Uh, so we're going to sing all together so everybody can make some noise. Okay, I'm just going to take one minute to give to our brother. There's a brother who walked in here, and obviously the uh, announcements were already passed. But uh, I'll just give you one minute just to introduce your family, please, and just to tell us where you're from, and we welcome here in Belleville Church of Christ. Please, <clears throat> if you may. <laughs> uh, my name is Andrew Walker. Uh, this is my wife, Noma. My son, Christian. My, my granddaughter, Michelle. And my son, Robert. Uh, we hail from, well, I'm from the U.S. We're all South African now, obviously. So uh, we live in Tiger Bay Hills. So this is our first time visiting a church. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you so much. We welcome here. Thank you. <clears throat> we appreciate you, brother. So let's sing together this one. Let's let's rise as we sing together. Let's rise and sing this one. <clears throat> okay, we'll start with the alto, and then we go to the bass, and then yeah, it goes goes. <clears throat> Love one another for love.
Alrighty, oh, good morning, everybody. Good morning, Harry. How are we all doing? Um, so this morning's scripture reading and prayer will come from Nehemiah one, and we're going to read the entire chapter of Nehemiah. Hope you're ready. Uh, okay, so this is titled uh, Nehemiah's Prayer, and it reads as follows: The words of Nehemiah, son of Hakilia, I think I pronounced that wrong, uh, in the month of Kislev. In the twentieth year, while I was in the citadel of Susa, Hananiah, one of my brothers, came, came from Judah with some other men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that survived the exile, and also about Jerusalem. They said to me, those who survived in the exile are, and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates have been burned with fire. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Then I said, O Lord, God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and obey his commands. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer your servant is praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my father's house, have committed against you. We have acted very wickedly towards you. We have not obeyed the commands, decrees, and laws you gave your servant Moses. Remember the instructions you gave your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands, then even if your exiled People are at the farthest na uh, horizon. I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. They are your servants and your people, whom you redeemed by your great strength and your mighty hand. O Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. I was cupbearer uh, cup to the king. Would you all just pray with me now? Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you once again on this lovely Sunday morning. We pray that uh, you will bless us and uh, open our ears, Lord, as Uncle D brings us this lesson. Help us to be like your servant uh, Nehemiah as we diligently pray to you and beg your forgiveness and ask that you do not look at our sins and rather that you forgive us for that that we have done wrong lord lord um, please help us to apply everything that we're going to hear now in our daily lives and implement it so that we can be good christians and good stewards as you have asked us to be uh, please bless this coming week father and as uh, we go into it and in jesus name amen I purposely asked Harrison to read um, a larger portion of this morning's text because what I want to bring home to us this morning that in the heart of Nehemiah, there was this godly unction and concern for his people back home in Jerusalem. Last week, Sunday evening, was a good meeting and we had a wonderful discussion and it presented so many opportunities that are ripe for us to participate in, get involved in, and being able to contribute to. I'm not quite sure how your life is, and maybe today you are bored stiff, and maybe you're around waiting for God to come and fetch you. But you see, so many times I watch this world. I've met an amazing woman this week. Treda Prekel. How old is she about? Treda Prekel is about 84 years old, and I was blessed that to be with Laurie, and he invited me along with him to meet with like-minded people when we are speaking about things that are of great importance for our country. But you see, here's a lady that really impacted my life because I watched her very carefully, how she articulated her concern for our country. There's a man by the name of Seth Gordon that I read an article about many years ago, and he said the following. He says, today, if you are bored, boredom is what empty space feels like. 
And you can use that empty space to go to something important. As soon as you're tired of being bored at work, at home, or even at lockdown, which you referred to at that time, wherever you go, you'll find a challenge. And I'm glad you're feeling bored. And now we're excited to see what you're going to do about it. That is exactly right what happens around us every single day. We can sit around and think through things very carefully and try to figure out just what we can do with our lives to make it more meaningful. Many years ago, I read a quote of a gentleman, and his name just fails me at the moment. He said, sometimes we are busy climbing ladders, but sometimes, and maybe at the end of your life, he said, God forbid that you find out that you have placed your ladder on the wrong wall and that your whole life is spent on a purposeless pursuance of that which just will be destroyed in the fire. There's a man that always inspires my life and I had long reason to read through the book, a Bible that, I, well, just uh, the introduction of the Bible that I got this week. In the book of Ezra and Nehemiah, it was actually not one, uh, each two individual books. It was one book in the old Jewish canon. And here we find that it gives the historical background to what was happening in Israel. When you read through the books of Kings and Chronicles, you'll find out that Israel was led by a few good kings and a few very bad kings. And they really and truly, the bad ones just took God's people further and further away from God. And eventually God had enough and he sent them into captivity. He would allow the very thing that he promised them not to happen. Delivered them into the hands of the pagan powers. Seventy years later, they were finally released from captivity. But what we find later on, especially within the time of the captivity, the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar, he ransacked the whole of Jerusalem, completely destroyed that city. The lifestyle, the culture, and the values, even the temple was destroyed. It was said that apparently he would burn down the walls of the temple because it was clad in gold. And they would literally remove all the rocks one from one another in order to get to the gold that is melted and is now sitting between the cracks of those rocks. And this man, Nebuchadnezzar, was one of the most motivated people around that would not leave any stone unturned. And he was an instrument of a righteous God. In the book of Isaiah, God speaks of this and he said, I will personally deal with Nebuchadnezzar later, but he's an instrument in my hand for now. What you find that in Jerusalem at that time, there was no country, there was no identity, if you can imagine a demolished city, no economic structure, there were no jobs, no government, no leadership, no direction, and worst of all, there was no hope. You see, many times when we read about wars in this world, we think especially of the, the German war, when Germany was completely annihilated as a nation. They had to pay war reparations. And yet we find in Japan the same thing when Hiroshima and Nagasaki was bombed. We find these people completely on their hands and knees. And we ask the question, what would have motivated these three nations to rebuild a nation today which are economic powers? The book of Ezra and Nehemiah gives us a glimpse into the history of Israel. Firstly, there were three great leaders that came in there. The first one was Zerubbabel, and he led the first group of Jews back and began to rebuild the, the temple. We find that Ezra the scribes led some Jews back. And here again, his role was specifically defined in, in Ezra chapter 7 verse 10, which says, Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it, and to teach statutes and ordinances in Israel. In other words, he would drive the concept of identity found in God and in his word. The third one was Nehemiah. He was a practical man that led a group of people back to rebuild the walls around Jerusalem. This morning we will look at Nehemiah. Nehemiah, as we know, was a cupbearer. 
I want you to consider the fact that he was an Israelite, but he was also in captivity. His position that he was in was a wonderfully privileged position. He had all the trappings of wealth. He was the man that stood between the rest of the contingent of politicians and the king, Nebuchadnezzar. He was the guy that would taste the food. He would check the food whether it was good quality. You do not come through anyone else but Nehemiah. And so his position was incredibly powerful, incredibly privileged. But we find there's something happens to Nehemiah. When some of his brethren comes back in Nehemiah chapter 1 verse 3, the remnant there in the province who survived the captivity are in great distress. And the walls of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are burned with fire. He turned around and it really affected him. He was told what had happened. Nehemiah knew that the gates had been destroyed 140 years before. But when he heard firsthand what was happening to his people, it affected him and he cried. I want to stop right there. So many times we find in a, in a country that we are in that people would say, I'm out of here, I'm going to find myself somewhere else and I'm going to relocate my family. But there are some folk that would turn around and say, hang on a minute. I've got this unction in my heart that I cannot stand by and seek my own and not do something about my people with whom I identify. He had a strong sense of identity. But I want you to watch how God would use this man in a very powerful way. He mourned, he wept, he fasted, and he prayed to God for days. He asked God for direction how he was going to be used very powerful in his kingdom. Sometimes, brethren, we would say that I have a feeling of concern. Then I lie down a little bit until the feeling passes. Not with Nehemiah. Nehemiah, somehow, he was not exactly one of these preacher type guys or an elder type or a deacon type. He was just an ordinary Joe like you and I. But what he understood was that God had placed this burden on his heart because he needed to do something about it. I want you to understand something very clearly. There's more to serving God than just talking about. We all can come up with wonderful theories and maybe some of them are just secular theories who we know is about empire building. But there is a spiritual principle that will come through here that will help you understand that it is not only different, but it is superior to what this world can ever bring. History will tell you that God's perfect church, God's perfect economy had unbundled four empires and they were laid in ruin. When you start to understand that there is something more powerful about God's kingdom, you start to realize that every kingdom, no matter how powerful it is, that is set to dominate, that is set to, to in, enslave, God can take it apart. You see, brethren, one of the key things is that he had a divine burden on his heart. Something far greater than just saying, oh, well, I'll send 20 rand to, to so-and-so and hopefully it'll help them. There was something far greater. Craig Grushel made the comment, he says, the burden you bear often reveals the calling that you embrace. In other words, when you sit down and you think to yourself, I see a problem, and I see there's something that we are missing as a community. You don't sit around and start to say, well, you know, I'm going to say nothing and I'll just watch how they go down. Let me say this to you. I'm warning you. This thing is serious. When we talk about a spiritual problem, it is an inclusive principle that includes all of us. Notice also this, that if you will not participate and help in reconstruction, God will do without you. But what you've been given will be taken away from you. That's a principle and that's been tested in the word of God, is written all over the pages of, of, of God. So that you can understand this is not a thumb suck, but this is fact. That's where Nehemiah was. He embraced something so powerful. He was not a priest. He was not a prophet. In terms of Jewish leadership, he was nobody. But he was an ordinary servant. He was a cupbearer to a king. But he understood one thing and one thing only, that he could make a contribution. That he could, out of his influence where he was, he could make a difference. 
Nobody appointed him to that position. And that is why he was attacked later on in the book by Sanballat and Tobiah. He was accused of trying to be a leader, and that was not true. And he was accused of that by pagans that were inside of Jerusalem that didn't want him there. They were among God's people, but they were enemies of God's purposes. You see, what happened here was that the other Jews must have heard about the problems in Babylon. Sorry, that were in Babylon would have heard about what's going on in Jerusalem. But some of them would just shake their heads and say, well, isn't that a shame? You know, it's just a tragedy. It is very tough and it's so sad and, and so on. But you see, that is just a condescending feeling of that's now a you problem. That's not a me problem. And that's sometimes exactly how we like to, to operate in the spiritual sphere. You see, brethren, so often when you feel that need that comes from Nehemiah, he also never allowed the overwhelming nature of the need to paralyze him, not to do anything. Out of emotional survival, sometimes people will say, I need to preserve myself, and so I'll withdraw myself. Well, you go right ahead. You don't see that in the Bible, not from anyone that he made a significant contribution to the kingdom of God. And that is called cowardice. And Revelation 21 verse 8 will tell you that you will not see the kingdom of God. All cowards won't go into heaven. The church of Christ is an adversarial instrument that is designed to knock down the, the the, the, all the powers of Satan. And it tells you in Matthew chapter 16 that he says that the gates of hell will not prevail against God's kingdom. And the person that said that wasn't some clown that was in a soapbox, but it was Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, the author of our, 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 our faith. And I'm also not saying that you commit yourself impetuously to everything and every need that comes around. It's just not wise but here's the key. There is something that you can do. And what Nehemiah says is that his heart broke when his people were struggling. It bothered him. I would imagine that Nehemiah probably also asked the question, surely there's other people that can do this. But then he realized that somebody's got to do something about it, but it might as well be me. He probably looked at his circumstances with regards to, and I'm referencing people like Esther that would have been reminded by Mordecai, telling her that, remember, you've been raised for a time like this. And if you miss this opportunity, God's salvation will come through someone else, Esther. God's, but you and your family, you will be destroyed. It is a choice every one of us make. When you think that you can back out from the unction that God is calling you to, you're making a big mistake. Don't try to tell me that there's another way. God's way is one way, and it's a one-way street of total committed and single-minded discipleship following the calling of Christ. But watch what Nehemiah does. The first thing that he does is what all of us do. We pray about it. Time and time again, we see Nehemiah going before God, praying and praying again. The first chapter tells us that he heard the news in the month of Kislev, which is normally November through to December. He starts praying and he prays until the first of chapter 2, the month of Nisan. It would imply that for four months, this man was fasting and praying. He was imploring the God of glory and saying to him, I want you to notice that for four months, Lord, I'm taking this seriously. I need your help. God, give me the words. God, give me the wisdom. Please direct my steps. I don't find this in any of the books of Babylonia writing up a how to do things. That's why I'm coming to you. The one that placed this burden on my heart is going to be the one that's going to direct my steps and the one that's going to chart a course out of this. In chapter 2, we see that the king notices. And let me say this, it's a very important principle to notice. Is that part of his life is to always be jovial. Always be the positive cat around the king. Yeah, Nebuchadnezzar says to him, hey, but what's going on? What's going on with you? And then in verse 4, the king says to Nehemiah, what are you requesting? You see... 
He didn't just answer. Chapter 2 verse 4, he says, the king said to me, what do you request? And so I pray to the God of heaven. And here, what Nehemiah teaches us, don't shoot your mouth off. Before you are even saying something in conversation, you stop and say, Lord, please capture my mouth that I don't say something that could be destructive to your cause. Pray, pray, pray. The one that has placed the burden on your heart is the one who will give you direction. You see, brethren, here's the key. Somebody here might have a heart for something. And you might say to yourself, you know what? I'm not big enough to be part, but I can become a part of. It says maybe there's something that is so troubling in your heart that you say, I'm sure we can make a difference here. The first thing you do is you pray to God. The second thing you do is that you, do, you define your vision clearly. You start having a look at what you are up against. You see, one of the first things you do in any kind of research, academic research, is to define the parameters of your research. Identify the why. Identify what the problem statement is. What the problem is. State the problem in the most shortest way possible. In a research proposal, the shortest way possible, state the problem statement. Nehemiah does exactly that. Verse 5, he answers, If it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in your sight, I ask that you send me to Judah, to the city of my father's graves, that I may rebuild it. You see, all he said to him was, I can't see this going on. My father's graves are lying in ruins. My people are all over the place. I need to help them. You see, here we find that when you've stated your vision clearly, it's not caring about your problem, but also saying that, you know, when you look at things, you look at the world around you, you say, well, I don't like illiteracy. Well, I neither do I. But then we start looking around and saying, there are so many problems, children that are abused, children that need medical care. We don't have enough homes for people. And maybe in our nation, there are opportunities that you see that are so glaring that you ask yourself the question, I'm going to need a trillion rand or trillion dollars, whatever the case is, to try to rectify what we are dealing with. Nebuchadnezzar asked him, what do you want from me? And then he says, please send me to, Jer to, Jer to Judah so that I can rebuild the walls. And here again, be clear to your boss and say, please, I need time off. I need to do this. When I sat with the elders saying to them that I needed time off, I needed time to rest, I needed time to study, I needed time to look around, to review what I know from the scripture and see in person some things that I needed to learn from. I needed to do some things for myself some historical, historical research. It's for my own learning and my wife's learning. In the third place, when you've got your vision and you've prayed, then you, the third one is you start to make a plan. Nehemiah chapter 2 verse, verse 6. Then the king said to Nehemiah, the queen also sitting beside him, how long will your journey be and when will you return? I want you to know the following. He didn't say to the king, look, ah, oh, you caught me a little bit on the back foot here. I haven't really thought about it. I worked for many excellent CEOs who are still part of massive corporations. I'm not talking about little, uh, I'm talking about big corporations where they run multiple entities. And I remember speaking to one of them. It's a wonderful man and I really wish I could see him again. He always said to me, Derek, when you say something, be clear. Define your terms. And then tell me what you want. Our meetings were something like three to five minutes long. But I promise you, that guy had such an incisive mind that in three to five minutes, you could literally reach your question, you could tell him what you need, and it was done. And immediately, you got what you needed. And that's exactly what happens to men in that kind of leadership position, like Nebuchadnezzar. They didn't get there because they fell off a rock and it fell into their armpits and said, well, here's a kingdom for you to handle. These men had to be in command of large armies. 
They had to fight with infighting of political people that tried to usurp them and to balance all those, those, those eventualities. He needed to know where he was at all the time. And then he says, if it pleases the king, send me. And when I had given him a time, now Nehemiah told him what the time frame was. That was specific for the king and exactly how much time he would have needed. And it tells you that when you are planning something, be clear on your terms of reference. Don't come there with a half-hatched plan. Nehemiah chapter 2 verse 7, if it pleases the king, and he says to him, Sir, I need the following. If it pleases the king, let letters be given to me for the governors of the region beyond the, the river, that they must permit me to pass through till I come to Judah. In other words, he's saying, I need your voice to protect me where I am going. I need you to direct me and I need your letter that I can present to them. Don't touch this man. Don't impede his progress. Let him through. And then he goes on and says in a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me turba and make beans for the gates of the citadel, which pertains to the temple for the city wall and for the house that I will occupy. He said, Lord, I want you to help me because I need a place to stay while I'm working there. I also need something from you that will help me. I want you to instruct Asaph so Asaph can cut timber for me so I can have that to take with. So when I build a place for me to live in, I've got everything that I need. In other words, tell the cat that's in, star, in charge of the stores that he will release what I need so I can do my job. He was very clear. Sometimes we say, well, you know, there's so much hunger and so much starvation, and we're so immobilized. The fourth point that he did was very powerful, is to inspire other people to follow and to see what he sees. You see, the fourth principle of this entire book is he says that I want you to understand that this is not a me problem, but it's a we problem. You know, sometimes, brethren, when we look at budgetary constraints, we often say, well, you know, I don't know how they're going to do that. Well, here's the story. Let me lay it out to you very clearly. It's a we problem. Okay. It's a we problem. It's not a me problem. It's an us problem. When it comes to the kingdom, every single one of us had been submitted to the will of God. It's your choice to withdraw your will from God, but the consequences you will bear. You see, the key behind it all is that Nehemiah made it clear, and he says that this is a we problem. Look how he deals with the church, Nehemiah 2.17. You see the distress that we are in. How Jerusalem lies waste and its gates are burned with fire. Come, let us build the wall of Jerusalem so that we will no longer be a reproach. These, he was talking to people that are in captivity. Let me speak to you about something that you might not have thought about. The humankind's ability to adapt to adverse circumstances is incredible. And so too we find it here that people in, in, in captivity were comfortable there. But he was saying to them that way back home, your family is in distress. This is an issue where, yes, sure, we are, are in captivity here, but there are others that are in worse shape than we are. The Apostle Paul speaks of that in Corinthians 8 and 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 8 speaks of the, of the, of the, the blight in Jerusalem. Where they said, let us send resources to help them. They are ours. We are one. It's a we problem. Let us rise in verse 18 and build. You see, this motivation wasn't just a one-time thing. It was an intentional focus to say, let's get on with it. I often speak to people that are struggling with depression. Have a plan and work your plan. And then go to like-minded people who can guide you through to navigate it accurately. Verse 18, Nehemiah said, And I told him of the hand of my God, which had been good upon me. He says, I told him that God has been good to me, that I've got a functionality here in captivity. But I cannot ignore the fact that there are people back in my hometown that hasn't got food on their table. 
And I'm comfortable to say, that's a you problem. You see, brethren, in verse 18, some of the burdens that God lays on our heart, we can accomplish all by ourselves. But there's some of them that we need to accomplish together. But the principle is that God will never leave us, nor will he forsake us. John Wesley made a comment many years ago that is still true. He says, you know, uh, light yourself on fire with passion with God for people. And people will come from miles to watch you burn. And the picture is that you and I must be passionate about the kingdom of God. So that people can see that we are serious about the kingdom values and the reign of Christ being held supremely in our life. And that every aspect of our life is subordinated to the will of God. Many years ago, I spoke to uh, 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 Stephen Labrand, and I think he was sitting in the exact chair that he's sitting in now. And I told him about what I saw in Fasanta Kral. And right there, him and I started praying about it. Today, we've got a program, I think it's running into its, how many years, Celia? Running into its eighth year. And here's the key. There are folk that saw that they could do, make, some, make a difference. They saw that they could change the lives of these children. Within five years, and Celia received a, 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 an award, and so did this church, of the greatest contribution that that school improvement in its academics had outstripped all other schools in its improvement. That was exactly the time when we started, and those kids became, uh, uh, tra they, they exited the matric. You and I can do that. You see, Susan has an unction for the kids at Fasanta Kral. She goes and works with the people with Jenny and with Mariki and Cecile. And they work with folk that, that probably in this lifetime would never have the opportunity to reap Morningstar. What did I say? You know what I mean, Morningstar. And even yesterday, I mean, we took the children to the beach. I think it was 15, 16 children. I've never in my life heard such a screaming and shouting and ranting and raving with Wayne and myself and Sue and the, a couple from Morningstar. The children were singing. In fact, the kid that was driving with me in the car, he says to me, excuse me, does that radio of yours work? <laughs> and I said, no, I'm not, I never switch on the radio. I just like silence because I don't like, um, I, I like to think while I'm driving and pray. And he says, oh, is it? <laughs> okay. But while we were driving, a Wayne rocked up there with a lot of kids in the car. And I promise you, I saw that Fortuna to this doosh, 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 doosh. <laughs> Children were singing, they were shouting, and we had an absolute wonderful day out at the, on the beach. One of the children came and he said, you've changed the way that I look at myself. You see, brethren, here's the key. All it cost was a few rands and five, six hours out of our day. But the investment will have an eternal impact in the lives of these children around us and people around us. And so we are never selfish. You see, because we are kingdom-minded, whatever we get from God in the one hand, we, we give with the ne next hand, and we become conduits of His glory. We become conduits of the goodness that God has. And it reminds us back to chapter 12 and 17 of the Abrahamic province that God has given by faith, where he said, you must be a blessing to the nations. Jeremiah chapter 29 verse 11 is selfishly interpreted as God is going to make me good. It's not true. Inside of that very promise and instruction to God's people, he tells them, I want you to go and seek the good of the city. You see, brethren, here's the key. If you do not improve the world around us, let this thing stand on its head and put it right side up where Christ is king. Many years ago, I watched a guy who was in charge of a massive corporation. And he was talk, giving a talk. I think it was a TED talk. I wish I could come across it again. And this particular man got in the trenches in a very, very difficult community in Africa. And he started to help them to dig trenches. And one of the fundamental errors that were made in that trench was that the angle of the water flow was incorrect. And so what he did was he didn't stand there and say, oh, you idiot. He jumped into the trench and he said to them, let me show you how it's done. 
And then he said, what you're doing here now is we are trying to direct filth, all the garbage out of the bathrooms and the toilets down to a landfill where it's going to be composted. And he says the angle is crucial so that it can flow down and not stay in the pipe. And here was a man that is probably worth a couple of billion dollars jumping in the trenches. And he showed them how. And then he made a comment which I will never forget. The interviewer wrote to him and says, why are you doing this? He says the most important part of a healthy economy and of democracy is that you are continually developing your potential market because the better they do, the better we do. It's a fool that thinks that he can only pocket things for himself. It's a person that's not kingdom-minded, that thinks that God's kingdom resides around my belly button. It's greater than that. And so this morning, I implore you to think differently about your life this year. The next couple of weeks, we're going to be speaking about opportunities to serve. I cannot begin to tell you, sitting in a meeting last week Sunday with people that love God, that honors God with their lives unselfishly, put up their hand and said, count me in. Let me say this to you. Sometimes we feel we have the right to say, well, you know, this is not as good. But I'm going to say what another brother said to me. This is the best we got because they've stepped forward. And maybe you think that you are better. And maybe you are. But we will work with the best that we've got. The book of the Bible will tell you to the nth degree between David and Saul that Saul thought he was better and God, his life ended in ruins. And God took a man like David, a nobody, and he changed the world and the direction of his people. You better learn from history. You better learn from history that God's not looking for superstars. He's looking for a humble and a willing heart. The heart like Nehemiah. Men that was a nobody today is written about for all of us to read and to learn about. Maybe this morning you feel in your heart you want to turn to God. I want to encourage you to do that. It's the best thing you could possibly do. Why? Because you are living right here. Yeah, yeah. And God's saying, I'm calling you upward. There, there. I'm calling you higher. There's more. There's more to this life. Rip the juices out of it and let's get together, put shoulder to the wheel and turn this world right side up with Christ at its head as he intended it to be. May God be glorified this year more than ever before by our lives. Let's stand and close with a song for invitation. Lord, be with you till we meet again. By his sons of death, I hold you. With his sheep, I surely follow you. God, be with you till we meet again. Till we meet, till we meet, till we meet at Jesus.
Joe, uh, my late mom always got upset when, when they sang that song at the end of the service. It's actually a fun funeral song. <laughs> you know, till, till we meet at Jesus' feet. Kom eens bid som. Zo mag de God en onze vader. Vader, dank je voor jullie geleentheid wat ons gehad het om als gemeente bij elkaar te komen. En onze vader, ons dank je voor al die sieningen wat ons so reiklik in die dag het die vader aan te ontvang. Ons dank je voor die leven self, en vader, dat jy ons sien met alles wat ons nodig het om jy te kan dien, en vader, en om te kan leven. En onze vader, ons bid dat jy altijd ons harte oprecht dankbaar sal maak vir alles wat jy ons mee sien. En die besonder dank is jy, vader, vir jy die geleentheid wat ons gehad het om die woord te kan open. Vader, ons dank jy vir ons dienst na Gterik. Vader, jy vir talente wat jy om gegeet, en vader, en die harde werk wat jy doen om voor te berei, om die woord van waarheid aan ons oor te dra. Vader, ons dank jy vir al die besoekers wat samt ons in die dag jy kon gader, en vader, jy bid elkeen van ons ontvankelijke hart vir jy woord sal gee. Vader, dat daar jy haar woord op vruchtbare harte sal val, dat sal opbring, en vader, dit wat goed en soet is in die koninkryk. Vader, ons dank jy vir die gemeente, en vader, ons bid dat jy die Belbel gemeente sal sien, vader, in die pogings en die werk en die programme wat hulle doen, en vader, dat jy die hand van sieninge oor al die projekte sal hou. So waar ons bid vir die leiders in die gemeente, o vader, die verwissoons sal weisheid, o vader, wat uit die woord uitkom. Ons bid vir elke lid van die gemeente, o vader, dat ons altyd nabe in die woord sal lewe, dat ons daar die woord sal toepas in ons lewe. Vader, ons weet dat ons geloof uit daar die woord uitkom, dat ons altyd dit sal gebruik, en dat ons wacht voor ons mond sal plaas, o vader, en dat ons oor sal lei, en altyd ons oor gevestig sal hou op Jesus, ons leidman en ons verlosser. Vader, ons bid vir diegene wat jy nodig het in die dag, vader, jy ken jy alke sy besonder sy behoefte, Vader, ons bid vir die Heer, gevaar, waar alle dier hulle uitdagings gaan, ons bid vir diegene wat oud is van daar, wat in stilte, o vader, in pijn is, o vader, en wat alleen is, o vader, in die dag. Vader, ons bid dat jy ons instrumenteel sal maak en instrumente sal wees, o vader, dat jy in die behoeftes van amal sal voorsien. Ons bid dat jy ons harte sal lei, o vader, dat ons die dinge boor die son sal bedink, o vader, en dat ons sal weer dat die vrede wat van jy afkom, wat dier die woord kan kom, wat alle verstand te boven gegaan, dat net dier jy sal kom. Vader, ons bid in die dag, gevaar vir al die predikers van gerechtigheid, recht oor die wereld, die die woord van baard in die dag verkondig het. Vader, ons bid dat jy elkeen van ons in die besonders sy sien, as het mekaar uit sal gaan, dat jy, as het jy wil mag wees, dat jy ons paie altyd gelijk sal maak, dat jy ons sal boete bewaard, dat jy volgende keer by mekaar sal kom in die sisse naam, amen. Amen.